before I jump into the sermon, I want to begin with uh, an announcement about one of the social justice ministries of our church. I actually told folks that I was going to give this announcement last week and then forgot to amidst the hubbub of Sunday morning, and I was reminded this week. Um, Last February, we held a congregational meeting, engaged in the democratic process, and held a vote on whether or not to declare ourselves a sanctuary congregation willing to provide sanctuary to a person under threat of deportation, someone who has made the decision that seeking physical sanctuary inside a church is their best course of action in order to stay alive, in order to stay together with family or in order to pursue their immigration case. Last February, we voted 140 in favor, four against, eight abstaining. And over the past year, there's been a tremendous amount of work done as well as a whole bunch of bumps in the road. One subcommittee, led by Doug Shear and Anna Rain, went through a process of designing a training, recruiting volunteers, and holding trainings. We're excited to say that more than 100 people have identified themselves as volunteers, and 70 have been trained. Another subcommittee, led by Salem (coughs) McNee, worked to prepare our space, collecting donated furniture, painted, cleaning, decorating, getting things ready. The building and grounds team of Brad Kasiba and John Lestina, working with Art Andrade, they took together, they took on the, the harrowing project of renovating two bathrooms, And then there was the sewer, (laughs) which frustrated me to no end. But at last, that project got completed. I have never been so emotional over the flushing of a toilet. (laughs) (laughs) So last week, I would have announced that we have sent notice to the North Carolina Council of Churches, the American Friends Service Committee, the North Carolina Sanctuary Coalition, our partner churches locally and throughout the state, and to Hispanic and Latinx advocacy organizations saying, hurrah, at last, we are ready. And so since you all voted last February, I wanted to give you this update about the status of that ministry. between that announcement and my sermon this morning. I have this colleague, esteemed Unitarian Universalist colleague named Kendall Gibbons, and she came up with a list of what she calls the 12 characteristics of spiritual maturity. And periodically, I like to preach on those characteristics. In fact, I've kind of committed myself to, over the course of, not not in a, in a season, but over the course of, of several years of trying to uh, preach on as many of them as I can. Last February, I wrote a sermon about one of those characteristics, Tong Len, a Buddhist concept dealing with being open to the presence of suffering. Back in November, I preached a sermon about attraction to beauty which is one of the 12 characteristics. And then there is this characteristic, one of the 12, surrender. And I thought, I'm going to preach on that one to get it over with. No, just, <laughs> it is, we're going to consider surrender. And I have to tell you, it's, it's one of those things that it seems to me that that a lot of Unitarian Universalists, heck, a lot of people struggle with. Surrender is a, is a term that I think makes some people uncomfortable and uneasy. Is anybody else uncomfortable or uneasy with the word surrender? Anybody? I see some nods. I see some nods. I don't want to be alone up here. <laughs> I bet there were even some people who didn't come to church this morning because they sort of a topic they didn't want to hear about. <laughs> So you let them know how good the sermon is. <laughs> Here's what I think about when I think about surrender. 
I think about a trip I took last February, and I want to describe it just so you can imagine it with me. Last, uh, last November, I took a trip, did I say February? Yeah, it says February here, but that's not right. Last November, I, I took a trip with Maureen O'Rourke and Mary Hewlett, and we joined a group, of, uh, a group from Greensboro, and we went down to middle of nowhere, Georgia, to visit the Stewart Detention Center, where at any time roughly 1,500 to 2,000 immigrants are detained. It was built as a federal prison, but has only ever operated as a place to warehouse immigrants. There we visited with an organization, El Refugio, which is working to support detainees and their families. Actually, a few weeks after Maureen and Mary and I were there, Samantha B. went and visited and was in the, in the same room that we were, Samantha B. from, from television, and uh, she actually gave this, uh, did a whole program on them and made a really generous donation. And so, that was really cool. So we, we saw, ooh, I sat on that couch where Samantha Bia <laughs> sat. During the trip, the central part of it was to make a visit to immigrants detained there. I haven't talked much, that was a, more than two months ago, I haven't talked much about this trip. In some ways, I'm still trying to process it, to come to terms with it. At Stewart, I visited a man named Israel. We visited in a cinder block room, separated from each other by inches thick glass, talking over staticky telephone receivers. The information that we had was that Israel spoke English. He didn't. He was a native French speaker from Haiti. He's also pretty fluent in Spanish, and I am a very, very rusty Spanish speaker with absolutely no French Creole. We did our best. As far as I can tell and as, I can, as far as I can understand, his story is something like this. He became an economic migrant after the earthquake in Haiti, first traveling to the Dominican Republic, then South America, Central America, attempting to earn enough for food, to eat, and a roof over his head, hoping to find some way to support wife and children. After the earthquake, his wife and children managed to come to the United States, and he was attempting to follow them. He never actually succeeded in setting foot in the United States. He was stopped at the border in San Diego, and later transferred to the Stewart Detention Center, he has no idea where Georgia is. And Stuart has been his home for the past two years. He is charged with no crime. I know this because he told me that, but I also know it because there is a color coding of the detainees there. Those in blue are charged with no crime. Those in red and orange have been charged or convicted with some offense. Those in blue just seem to be there because there seems to be nowhere else. It's a miserable place. The conditions are abhorrent, dehumanizing, and deplorable. Many inmates spend 23 hours per day in a bunk room, one hour in an outside yard. The food is bad. The medical care substandard. My guess is that Israel is probably a little bit younger than me, and I try to put myself in his shoes. How would I react if faced with the same circumstances? Could I survive there? I'm pretty confident that I could last two days. I have my doubts about two months, let alone two years. My theory, my theory about Israel, who has spent the last two years languishing in a prison in Georgia, my theory is that by necessity, he has learned to practice surrender. During our hour visit, Israel and I talked about the Bible. So the Bible is hard enough to talk about in English. <laughs> 
We talked about characters from the Bible. It was his, his choice. That's what he wanted to talk about. He told me that he could relate to the story of Job. I should say so. As we talked, though, I had this revelation. The characters in the Bible I thought about gravitated towards are the prophets, the ones who see an injustice, set apart trying to right that injustice, and then keep on trying. The characters in the Bible who he talked about were the ones who had something hard, something catastrophic happen to them, something they did not choose, they could not control, and who managed to face tragedy and hardship with strength, acceptance, equanimity. Surrender does not mean abandoning hope. I actually think that Israel can be described as hopeful. Surrender does not mean not trying to take steps to improve one's situation. I actually experience Israel as, interesting, as interested in doing whatever he could do to make his conditions a little better than they were. But by surrender, I mean simply this. Surrender is recognizing that there are some things that we cannot control. Recognizing there are some things we cannot control and living within an acceptance of those limitations. It's a hard thing to do. Let me clarify what I'm saying. It is deeply problematic to take someone's suffering and then to find a, spirit, a silver lining of spiritual growth within it. There's something uneasy about that. I actually, I erased more paragraphs of his sermon than I wrote trying to wrestle with this. Because what Israel has experienced is a moral atrocity full stop. But one of the things his story elicits in me is an awareness of how it is my default setting to want to control all the parts of my life and to fear and to dread anything that does not fall within my control. Liberal religion, as well as large sections of American society, are deeply invested in the exercise of agency, which is the ability to act the exercise of freedom, the making of choices, and through what we believe is self-determination. Now whether any of us are as free as we might like to think we are is a question we could probably debate. And that would probably be a different sermon. And of course we also live in a society in which systems of power and systems of oppression allow some people to exercise more agency than others on account of race, class, gender, and so on. And so surrender, when I talk about surrender, it is a concept that is complicated and problematized, and depending on one's social location, potentially traumatizing. Here's what Reverend Kendall Gibbons says about surrender. She says, surrender, which in many traditions is connected to the will of God, in my thinking, has to do with remembering our finitude. That we do not run the universe and do not need to as well as giving up the notion of controlling reality through wishful thinking, but rather by submitting to evidence and fact. Let me read that again. Surrender, which in many traditions is connected to the will of God, in my thinking has to do with remembering our finitude, that we do not run the universe and do not need to, as well as giving up the notion of controlling reality through wishful thinking, but submitting to evidence and to fact. In many religious traditions, surrender 
has to do with a surrender to God or a surrender to the will of God. Islam, the term actually means surrender or submission. And when I read that within prison populations, Islam is the fastest growing religion, it makes sense that a religion that talks about how to live within this surrender would be attractive. There are members of our church who see surrender this way, as surrendering to the will of God. And there are also members of our church who find that problematic. Members of other churches who find that problematic, too. And so I want to talk about this more humanistic level of surrender that Kendall Gibbons seems to suggest. That surrender has to do with remembering our finitude, with recognizing that we do not run the universe and do not have to, and that we cannot control reality through wishful thinking. Remembering our finitude. Has there ever been something that you wish you could control, but could not? Has there ever been something you wish you could control, but could not? When we think about it, when we think by imagining, imagining large, we realize that we are, in fact, finite. We do not control creation of galaxies, the expansion of the universe, the orbits of the planets, <clears throat> obviously. Things smaller. We don't control the rotation of our planet, when the sun will rise or set. Think smaller. We don't control entire populations, movements. Think smaller. Most of us, there's somebody in our life who we wish that they would stop doing what they're doing. But, oh, I don't get to control that. Some of us, I wish I could stop doing what I'm doing. <laughs> it's even hard to control that. Surrender. Rumi says, Be crumbled so wildflowers will come up where you are. You have been stony for too many years. Try something different. Surrender. We do not run the universe, and that's okay. And we cannot control our lives or the world through wishful thinking. So I want to end this morning by reading from uh, a passage from a book that has to do with that. Um, there was a very prolific and controversial Unitarian Universalist minister named Forrest Church. At age 59, he contracted esophageal cancer and was given a terminal diagnosis. His gift to the world was as he went through this uh, dying process, he actually wrote a book about the, the spirituality of facing what he could not control. He talks a little bit about surrender. He says that his, his mantra is, be who you are, do what you can, want what you have. But he writes this, and I want to read from it. He says, In each of our lives, not only will some rain fall, but fires will burn, the ground will shake, and one day life itself will be exacted in payment for the gift of life bestowed. By wanting what we have, doing what we can, and being who we are, our cup will forever be half full, not half empty. And if we can do these with reverence, 
humble humility and awe our cup will run it over. The alternative, he says, to long for what we lack, for things we have lost or shall likely never find, offers little save the sour pleasures of regret. <clears throat> Fantasy is no better. Wishful thinking is sloppy and sentimental. We should think to wish instead for things a little closer to hand. If we can wish for the courage to bear up under pain, for the grace to take successes lightly, if we can wish for the liberation that comes with forgiveness, the energy to address tasks that await our doing, the meaning that's to be found in giving, to our, giving ourselves to others, the patience to surmount things that are dragging us down, and the joy to be gained in even the smallest endeavor. If we can do those things, surrender to those, then we will be on the right path. He says, I call this thoughtful wishing. Wishing for what is already ours here and now to have, to do, and to be. What are your thoughts on surrender? On what Kendall Gibbons says is the spiritual practice of remembering our finitude of acknowledging that we don't run the universe, and of not attempting to control reality through wishful thinking. They are hard challenges. Hard challenges indeed. Those are my thoughts on surrender, and I want to end with uh, the hymn that I thought was most relevant to uh, the sermon topic, it is um, a beautiful hymn from the Christian tradition, number 108, My Life Flows On in Endless Song, How Can I Keep From Singing? And I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together. <clears throat> 